Hi, my name is Carlos Sanchez. I am the director of the Latino Business and Economic Development Center at Ferris State University. And I have the pleasure today to be here with uh, Henry Munoz III uh, after his uh, conversation at Fountain Street uh, Church, uh, part of the Grand Rapids Community College Diversity Series. Uh, thank you very much for having, for, for, for being here, for having us as, as uh, your guest in that presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start by, um, by telling people the, the, how diverse your, your life is, really. Um, you're a designer. You're a philanthropist. You're an activist, an entrepreneur. I wonder if all those, let's say, all those skins are one and the same, or do you feel more, more comfortable in one of those, let's say, activities? Which one? Well, maybe at the heart of um, what I think I was put on this earth to do is the design of um, the realization of a vision of a people. And that can be expressed in different ways. It can be expressed in the design of a building. It can be expressed in the design of a social activist program. Uh, but in the end, I think you know what I have some talent for is um, I can listen to people. I can see how to help them achieve what they want to achieve. And then I can design a way to help them get there. So I think it's all connected, whether mm -hmm. it be architecture or activism, philanthropy or politics. Um, I'm a designer. I can see things. Thank you. And, and I, I believe that is, uh, without trying to assume what the president might have uh, in <laughs> mind, I, I assume that that's what he was thinking when he uh, chose you to lead the, the effort, the commission, uh, or to be part of the commission for the, the, Latino, the Smithsonian Latino Museum uh, on the mall. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's a very um, important issue for the Latino community of the United States. And it really began many years ago when I was um, only 37. I was appointed to serve on the Smithsonian National Board by um, the secretary of the Smithsonian at the time because he recognized that it was important, it was in the best interest of the nation's museum for it to be fully representative of the contribution of all of the peoples mm -hmm. of the country. And if you went, um, if you walked along the mall in Washington, D.C., and you went to the American History Museum or you went to the Natural History Museum at the time, you probably did not see yourself, if your last name was Sanchez, you wouldn't see yourself in those exhibitions. And in fact, there was a report that was done and uh, given to Congress. And the name of the report, which basically said, here is the, the report of how the Smithsonian is accomplishing what it needs to accomplish on behalf of Latinos in our country. The name of it was Willful Neglect. And so that'll pretty much tell you what it thought. And, and so slowly over a period of time, there was an effort to begin to diversify first the collections and the, and the representation of our nation's museum. Then it became an effort that was, uh, became a piece of legislation filed by Congressman um, Javier Becerra of California to create a commission to study whether there should be a museum. I think uh, because of my history with the Smithsonian, I was elected chairman of that commission by my peers. And um, that commission itself issued a report to the members of Congress that said, yes, of course, the place where um, the American people celebrate their history and their heritage, where some of the most important public conversations about who we are as a country um, have been achieved on the National Mall, the mall in Washington, D.C., and of course there must be a Smithsonian American Latino Museum. And so I think this is, um, we shouldn't forget that that piece of legislation is sitting there in Congress and hasn't been passed, and that there it needs to be passed to create this museum. Uh, uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, it, is, it is interesting that uh, sometimes, you know, when you look at uh, long periods of time, you can see how one thing relates to another. Um, you spoke about that the report it was willfully, willfully, 
I'm sorry, willful neglect neglect of the Latino history. Yet yesterday, in in the presentation, and one of the first questions from an individual was, why why are we talking so much or we're paying so much attention to the Latinos right now? So on one side is we've been neglected, but yes, somebody thinks we're paying way too much attention on Latinos. Um, at first, uh, it was a, it was a great response, right? And 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 continuing back to that, but why should we care so much for Latinos right now? Because we should care about um, the American people, and because this is a critically important. If I, you know, to the young people in the audience who are listening, we have a choice. This is a moment when you, when the country, can become a country of hate, or whether this country will continue to be a country of openness and the best principles of democracy. So, you know, the way to look at this, I think, is that the country is best when all of its people understands the, the differences and the commonalities of the American people. You cannot understand uh, the history of Latinos in this country if there's not a place for you to visit to to witness those stories. You cannot understand the history of this country if you think that Latinos are only immigrants who just arrived. Uh, you need only look, for example, at the 450th anniversary of St. Augustine, Florida. Right? There was a settlement of the Spanish in this country 450 years ago before there was really a country. And yet that's not the story that we read about, the history that is written in our textbooks. And so to have the nation's museum say, oh, maybe the way that we told the story before is not the right way, and it is time now for a young person named Carlos Sanchez to be able to get to Washington, D.C., and when they walk into the American History Museum, to f see that fully realized because there's somebody who looked like him who received the Congressional Medal of Honor, and that medal is in the collections of the Smithsonian, or to be able to walk into the National Museum of American Art and see a beautiful piece of artwork by Luis Cruz Asaceta, or to be able to walk into a building called the National Museum of, of Latino, the National Latino Museum, and see all of those stories, all of that tradition, and all of those contributions, because that's what, that's those contributions that really are the American story. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's time to uncover what has been covered for so, for so long, because I believe that it is also affecting the psyche of, of our young Latinos to not, not see the reflection in 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 books in in history, right? It, uh, I, I think it creates a we're damaging sometimes their their psyche, their 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 future. Well, I think that we have to come out. You know, I think that we have to be proud of being Latino. Maybe we need to be openly Latino, and I think we have a choice of how we do that. I think you can um, be hateful, like some of the people running for president of the United States. Uh, want to be right now, or we can respond with grace and with civility and with love and compassion and understanding for, you know, our country. And that's, the, I think, the important thing for young people, for college students. I don't even think that they understand yet how much power they have to change the course of American history. And I think for a designer like myself, designing a program by which young people understand that if they s will simply exercise one aspect of their voice, the power to vote, they actually will decide this election, and this election will be um, an election that hopefully resolves itself on the side of peace and love and not on the side of hate and racism. Totally uh, agree. It was uh, I think that was one of the pieces that, that touched me the most of your presentation yesterday. That I was absolutely right. We are at a moment of it, it is a defining moment in our country's history, um, and uh, we need to we need to decide what is going to define this moment. Right? Is it going to be hate, or is it going to be love? Or is it going to be 
future. Well, the greatest traditions of movements in our country that have been fueled, energized by young people, by college students, have all been, um, in the end, while they may have been born from tension, mm -hmm. cultural tension in this country, in some cases even violence, they all have, have resolved themselves peacefully after the country has begun to understand that you cannot have justice for this country unless that justice exists mm -hmm. for all people. I was really struck yesterday to have been an honor to have been invited to the White House and to see this mixed race uh, president mm -hmm. of the United States sitting next to the first Latino pope. And the very first words out of the pope's mouth, the very first words that he uttered on his very first trip to the United States was, I'm the son of an immigrant family. I am the son of an immigrant family, and I am honored to be a guest in your country, a country that has been in many ways built by families such as mine. So um, there you have, uh, in just a few simple words, a lesson of tolerance, I think, about what has been great about this country in the past, and what if we can see our way through, mm -hmm will be the foundation of a very bright future for this country as well. In order to get there, I think we have to have a full cultural understanding of who we are. As a people, I walk around this country, uh, this campus this morning, and I see you know, the beautiful faces of so many young people who, are, um, who will in their own way be achievers and contribute to the economy, to the culture, to the arts, the sciences of Grand Rapids of Michigan, and who knows? Mm -hmm. Where they will go, you never know. You never know. You never know. I have the pleasure of, uh, you know, working in a university. And my office is located in one in the the arts and the science school in uh, the Kendall College. Um, so I am now able to to I'm now involved and in, in, in surrounded by design, and and that just fuels my creativity. Um, so probably is is too early to say, but. We'd, would we see your design in the National Mall? My you design? <laughs> would the museum be your design? You should call the Smithsonian <laughs> and tell them they should hire me. Yeah. You know, um, I think I was put on this earth for a reason. I think that I've been uh, very successful in creating a movement within architecture and design where people have to consider that the buildings that we built should look like you and me. Correct. That if you're building a school or a university building and you hope to include, expand the opportunities for Latinos in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that maybe there's a connection between the way that uh, we learn and who we are and that it can be reflected in the environment if we'll only stop and listen to people when they say, uh, this is how we learn, this is who we are, this is something that you can put into a building that will help connect us to the hope and aspiration that should exist in that building. I think I've been successful in doing that mm -hmm. in cities now. I'm working on a project that um, considers that maybe there should be a Latino urbanism in this country, mm -hmm. that every major city in the United States, whether it be Houston or Miami or Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, all of them very different cities, all of them with what I would call a very diverse Latino population, that maybe we need to stop and think even about, for example, signage. Should signage be bilingual? Because you know there's a larger and larger percentage of Latinos who are populating the urban core of our city. So there's an idea, a major um, urban planning idea. And yes, I've been very fortunate to be um, placed in a context where perhaps one day there'll be a National Latino Museum on the Mall in Washington, D.C. Whether I'm the designer or not is less important than the way that that museum got there is going to be a reflection. The, 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 the collections of that museum, the exhibitry of that that will exist in that museum, I think in some ways will have been shaped by the conversation that I was able to be a part of, to help curate, and to design around the country. Mm -hmm. um, it, in the end, it isn't really about 
me or my firm. It's about the ideas, about the fact that now we're able to give voice to people even within architecture, people who've never thought that they could be a part of the design of a building, whether they went to architecture school or not. And so um, I'm very proud, I think, of of that part of my life. Of course you should be. Um, I, I was um, commenting earlier with somebody else that I, this afternoon, I'm going to give a presentation on, on diversity, more than diversity, um, uh, inclusion, and even furthermore, acculturation, assimilation, etc. cetera. Um, then along the lines of what you've done, uh, I'm not sure if you've, you or your firm coined the term uh, mestizo re regionalism. Uh, and if so, I, I, I see it as a, as a form of, a, yeah, acculturation, and, but both ways, right? So the Latinos are acculturated to this, this country. They've been acculturated to this country, but also now we see uh, Anglos acculturated to, that, to, to the Latino roots, and, and it's beautiful. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, that, that term. Well, I think uh, people, we have a notion that the United States is a country of purity, that we were founded by pilgrims at Plymouth Rock, and that is the history of our country, which is couldn't be further <laughs> from the truth. The great American experience of the 21st century is an experience of cultural blending, of, of you know, there's a phenomenon, young people know this better than people, my age, the best music that exists today is music that takes its influences from different places and takes bits and pieces and samples it and then uh, turns it back out as something new. And that really is the phenomenon of mestizaje, right? Mm -hmm. It was in the past uh, a, a union <laughs> between the indigenous people of the Americas and the people who came to the United States from Spain. And so it was the marriage of those. What I mean when I say mestizaje is that if you live in a community like the community I came from, San Antonio, it's not unusual, no matter what your last name is, to pull, drive through a Taco Cabana, pick up a breakfast taco, right, while you're listening to Tejano music mm -hmm. on the car radio. And that's really the way things are working in cities across the country. And in fact, I've said this before, we actually are led by a president who is a mixed heritage president. He himself, he may call himself, uh, I don't know, but he's a mestizo, right? I mean, he's, and so, you know, the, the, when you look around now, <laughs> when you walk down the street, you see people of mixed heritage, mix, mixed cultural influence. And so I think that it's important for um, everything to consider that there is a process of acculturation, that there is an assimilation that works differently in different places around this country, and that that is possibly the great cultural experience um, that will guide us going forward, right, is how you deal with uh, this mixing that is taking place mm -hmm. all around the United States. Yeah, I, I, I find it uh, fascinating that also it, it's sort of a dichotomy where it might not be the same people, right? <clears throat> but in this, this country, while well, some uh, try to maintain that purity that, uh, that, that you mentioned that it really does not exist, right? Uh, so we, we need to be all Americans and we need to all look like this and why not? But yes, Let's go and have tacos and, and yeah, I have a jarrito instead of, <laughs> a, right? And, and that is very normal, but, it, but no, 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 you, you should speak. Well, when people, and, so. when people coexist that way, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe something as simple as salsa is more popular than ketchup mm -hmm. nowadays, but when people have that very um, fundamental understanding of the way someone lives that's different than them, that comes from a different place. And there, you begin to have something that connects you or binds you to them. That is working against hate. Because there, that is also what you're describing as the root of the hate that is existing in this country right now. I have something. I don't want you to have it. If you have it, you're going to take it away from me. That's so anti-American, right? And so... I think anything that we can do 
to explain the, maybe I should call it, a, you know, mestizo is a diff difficult word, but maybe what we're designing um, in our firm is an architecture of identity, right? That there is an American identity of the 21st century, and that identity is mixed, and it is blended, and it is reflective of the way that this happens in cities across the country, and that if you can walk into a building, a university building, a building that's su supposed to accept people of diverse backgrounds to study next to each other, that maybe then we're planting the seeds of understanding and working against the hate that seems to be out there everywhere it's and we can't let that happen well that is the root of of the uh, university to be universal right in in, in thought and in and, and teachings of course so um, so speaking about uh, uh, university um, a lot of our Latino um, students aren't able to go to college mm -hmm. right uh, because they don't have access to federal grants uh, not because they're not they don't have the qualifications, but because of um, of their Im uh, immigration status. However, you and others have done something. They've not just sat on the sidelines and, and say, well, I don't know what to do. You've done something. The dream.us. Please share a little bit about it, because I, I think it's just a fantastic, fantastic idea. Well, um, thank you. The uh, dream was born out of a frustration, quite honestly, with our failure as a country to deal with immigration reform and the fact that there are millions and millions of people, who, um, most of whom are significant contributors to the economy and the culture of this country and who are living in the shadows because for everybody, the immigration system in the United States is difficult, complex, uh, difficult to navigate, um, most would say broken, and needs to be fixed. There will likely not be a fix to that immigration system anytime soon. And so sometimes when people uh, see that happening or not happening in government, they can um, create something that um, that changes people's lives anyway. So uh, a couple of years ago, I had the good fortune to meet Don Graham, who was at the time the owner of the Washington Post. And we had a series of conversations about how to help young people. It's really about helping young people. Don Graham is a very successful businessman and a very important person in Washington, D.C., but he's also a man who has spent his whole life creating access to education for young people who had no opportunity of ever getting to a college or university. That's really what he is about and what he stands for. And while I don't speak for Don, I think he'd say maybe his greatest achievement in life. And so we decided that we would start a scholarship fund for dreamers, for those students who are eligible for DACA, but who don't have access to federal funding, and in many cases don't have access to scholarship money in um, many cases. I met some here last night are afraid mm -hmm. to raise their hand and acknowledge that they're dreamers, that they're in this country, really through no fault of their own, in an undocumented fashion. So we said we got together with the dream community. We designed a program for dreamers by dreamers. We said, what, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could raise a million dollars? Then we said, wouldn't it be great if we raised two million dollars? By the end of the first year, we had raised $26 million. In the second year, we were joined by some of the greatest philanthropists in this century. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates, Laureen Powell Jobs, recently Mark Zuckerberg and his wife uh, gave $5 million to the dream. And now there is a scholarship fund that has the potential of educating thousands of dreamers. Um, and we've raised right around $91 million to accomplish that. That's really a testimony to what one person 
two people, a small group of everyday citizens can accomplish when they set their minds to it. It is a testimony to the fact that there are many people, including owners of the largest businesses in this country, who believe that there should be an answer to the issue of immigration reform uh, to help our country achieve what it wants to achieve in the future. And it is a, I hope, um, an opportunity for students in places like Grand Rapids, not only to receive scholarship monies, but to receive scholarship monies that then allow them to, to, to stay in school, either to have an associate's degree or a full four-year degree, because this is, a, this is a scholarship fund that is designed to help uh, students achieve their degree. It's not a, like a $2,500 scholarship. It is, if you attend a partner college or a partner university, the, the goal is that your college uh, career is paid for. And it's also a methodology for dreamers um, to find other dreamers and to find a support system and to find mentors and to be able to um, emerge into the light mm -hmm that higher education will bring. And, and I'm very proud, I will say this, I'm very proud, you know, I was in the room with the President of the United States when the, some of the very first ideas about what was accomplishable, um, when you knew you couldn't have um, immigration reform, what can you do? And the ideas of DACA presented themselves. So, you know, um, there's a there's a great American scholarship fund now that is helping um, young people everywhere that I go. I meet dreamers nowadays, um, very smart, very capable people who can give a lot to this country. Mm -hmm. That that is that is fantastic. One of the uh, as, as you were talking, I'm thinking one of the characteristics of what we're doing right now in the video and that we're not live is that you will stay for posterity, right? So um, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know, five years from now, 10 years from now, somebody can look at this video and say, oh my God, look at what they had to do to do that. That seems surreal. That seems, you know, in, in 2025, this is not, is not the case. Hopefully it happens <laughs> earlier than 2025, right? But, um, but I'm glad you're doing this. Well, I walked into the studio, I walked by a book. <laughs> by Martin Luther King. And the title of that book really was, Where Do We Go Next? Chaos or Community? Mm -hmm. And so here we're sitting, probably 25 years after the Reverend Martin Luther King wrote that book about his community. And I think our community is, the, in the American community, continues to face those same issues that were in that book that he inscribed for this diversity center. And so I think in order to avoid chaos, that everyday heroes can take one step, no matter what it is. You know, my father always told me what, that um, the movement of a people begins with the steps of just one person. And so whatever it is, I think, you know, even the students who listen to this today or five years from now, they'll be given an opportunity I don't know when it will come for them. They'll be given an opportunity to do something that uh, changes people's lives. And you know it when it comes, and you have a choice to do it or not to do it. And I hope most people will choose to do it, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've heard this, and I'm sure people tell you all the time. You're an inspiration. You're a role model. Uh, so when people come across to you in the street, uh, let's say a young, and, and it doesn't have to be Latino, but of course we, uh, we're talking about Latino, Latino students. When a young Latino student, male, female, comes to you and says, uh, uh, Mr. Munoz, can you give me words of wisdom? What would be, if we try to capture three things that a, 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 a young Latino has to do in order to succeed. Uh, you, you spoke yesterday, try, try to wrap around the, the, the thought, you spoke yesterday about voice, right? So what do you tell young Latinos that you need, they need to do in order to advance? You know, my grandmother was a very smart person 
who had eight children and who used to always say, uh, si Dios quiere, if God wanted it to happen, it would happen. And her daughter married a, a labor leader and they had four children and they chose to live their life a little bit differently. They believed that they were given an opportunity to impact the well-being of their own family and of other families if they worked to make things happen. And so I think that at this point in our country's history, it's important for young people not, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that motto, si Dios quiere, but it's really important that we not be shy, mm -hmm. that we not be bashful, that we recognize our own power, that we recognize that we do have a voice. We need to stand up. I always tell my employees, for example, that if you never ask, then you never get. You get a no from the very beginning. So I think I was so impressed last night by the young people who came to hear me speak and who asked questions because I think they were asking for mentorship. They were asking for guidance. So the very first thing is to show up and to ask for help incredibly important. Show up and ask for that scholarship. Show up and ask for that mentorship. You know, we come from, many of us come from families for whom we are the first generation to go to a college and university, so we don't have that experience. We have to ask outside of our family, how do I make this happen? How do I get this guidance? So the very first piece of advice is ask, ask for help, use your voice, stand up. The second um, piece of advice that I would give people is, you know, they wrote, Sheryl Sandberg wrote this kind of famous book um, in the last couple of years called Lean In, which basically was saying uh, you should use your voice. But I don't think that goes far enough for Latinos. I think you have to lean in and then you have to reach back and pull people along with you. I think um, what I'm trying to do, what the people that I've, you know, so in such a great way I've met across the country, People really want to help other people. So it's important that once you get there, right, once you've achieved that college education, once you have a job, that in some way you reach back. After you've leaned in, you need to reach back and pull somebody through that doorway of opportunity with you. And the, the third great uh, advice is pretty fundamental. There are so many countries across the globe where people are not able to elect their leadership their own leadership, you know. If in this next election, Latinos register and they vote, they will elect leaders who look like themselves, who share their cultural experiences, or who understand what the challenges and opportunities that are affecting them and their families are. When you're living in a moment of hate, when you have people who would call you a racist or a thief who doesn't understand the beauty or the complexity of this community, there is one thing that you have to do. You have to vote. An 18-year-old can vote and change the direction of this country. So there's three things. Show up, right? ask for help. Once you've walked through the doorway of opportunity, you have to reach back and bring somebody through that door with you. And right now, in this moment, you have to register and you have to vote because you need to have leadership in this country who understands you and wants to help you and wants to help your family. There's a way to fix the situation mm -hmm. for millions of young people who don't have access to college education, who don't have access to scholarships or Pell Grants elect a president of the United States who believes in you, not somebody who's going to call you a rapist <laughs> or your mother or your father a thief. Thank you very much. Um, I could spend another two hours here with you. Thank you. Um, but uh, I can only say that um, we really, really appreciate having you here in Grand Rapids, having you here at, uh, at Grand Rapids Community College. And uh, we, hope to, we hope to see you again. I hope you come back, not just once, twice, but many times. Um, we'll have a jarrito together. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor. Thank you very much, Henry.